Well, good morning, Rocky Peak. Great to see you here. It's so good to be with you. If we haven't met yet, my name's Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here as well. And just so good to be with you today. And uh, we're, I mean, I'm looking forward to uh, this time we have together in the Word. It's funny, backstage, you know, I'm normally out here during worship, but backstage when I got here, my iPad froze up. Um, and that's normally no big deal. I mean, I know how to unfreeze it. I know how to do a hard start. I, so I went to my phone. My phone wasn't working. Um, couldn't, like, couldn't get that instruct because that the normal thing wasn't working. So Scott Kim and I were back there for like 15 minutes. So I thought I was going to be going without notes today, but, uh, which would have been fun too, right? That would have been fun. Um, but uh, fortunately, we figured it out. And uh, so it's like, you, know, just know, you just know something good's coming, right? <laughs> you just know something good's coming. Um, uh, hey, on top of that, I've got one special announcement. Um, I want to give you a heads up early that uh, on November the 16th, so it's a Thursday night, we're having our next encounter here at Rocky Peak. And if you've been, this year has been unbelievable. Like our January encounter, we all agree, was the best one we've ever had, like in 18 years, right, that I've been here. Uh, and then in May, it was better. And so it was standing room only. God just met us in a powerful way. And uh, after that encounter in May, I really felt like the Lord was putting in my heart were to do another one. It was to be this fall. And the topic was to be the Holy Spirit, to focus on the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to be doing that on November the 16th. And one of the reasons I, uh, I'm encouraging you, like letting you know early, is because just for some logistical reasons I won't go into, but it's going to be more like the summer apologetic series where we, won't, we weren't able to provide childcare. We normally do. Of course, students uh, of all ages come in and join us in here. But if you have younger kids, that's the last week of life groups. If you're a Thursday life group, you're probably set. But if, you, if you're not, uh, I want to give you plenty of time to get set because I think I think this is going to be one of those nights to remember, you know, one of those, those kind of uh, point in time where we just go before the Lord and say, well, we want to know more about the person, uh, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Is there anything in our lives that's holding us back uh, for this season that we're in, this culture we're in? We need to be individually filled, led, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need our, Holy, our church to have a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. So it's an incredible night. I, I know it is. And so I just want to encourage you that if you call Rocky Peak home, um, that you would make this a priority and you come and join us as we seek the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, so we're going to go into our time of teaching. If you haven't done so already, you've got the program, uh, the message note sheet, green and white in your program. Those of you joining us online, special welcome. And you've, you can kind of download it in one of either three of your favorite formats, either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on which, which format you're watching. But if you guys are ready to go, I'm ready to jump in. You ready to go? So Father, we're, we're so thankful to be in your house in your day. And and you're, uh, Lord, I just remember uh, what your word says, that when you gather it in the name of the Lord Jesus, that the power of our Lord is there. And so, Lord, we just welcome you. You have said, call no one teacher, because you have one teacher. And so we acknowledge that you're our teacher, you're our shepherd, you're our leader, you're our Lord, you're our king, and we come only to hear your voice. You said, my sheep hear my voice. And so today, Lord, may we hear your voice, and then may we follow, because that's what you said, my sheep, hear my voice, and they follow me. And we pray this in your name, and everyone said, amen. 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 Well, once upon a time, a long, long time ago, in a far and distant land, There were two strangers who were approaching the gates of the capital city of the empire. And when they arrived, it didn't take them long to begin circulating bold and audacious claims. They had discovered the secret of making the finest, most beautiful cloth ever made in the history of the world. And not only was this cloth incredibly beautiful, it had magical powers for anyone who wore the cloth. And it didn't take long for their claims to reach the court of the emperor. And so before long, they were summoned to come and to stand before the king. And he asked them about their claims and they affirmed it. And they said, not only is this cloth the most beautiful cloth ever made, but this cloth has magical powers. That whoever wears the clothes made of this cloth 
gives him the ability to look at a person and discern who is wise and who is foolish, who is smart and who is stupid, and who is competent and who is incompetent. And the emperor was enchanted with this idea because not only did he want clothes made of the most beautiful cloth in all the world, but he wanted this ability to be able to staff his entire kingdom with those who are wise, not foolish, those who are capable, not incompetent. And so he immediately gave the orders. He commissioned these two weavers to set up their looms inside the castle in a special room and to immediately begin to go to work. And so they did. And when passerbys from the court would pass by, it would look as if the weavers were working furiously. Or so it seemed. Well, today, we're continuing this series that we've been in now for a while. It's called The Gospel of God. And I just want to, for those who are brand new, a uh, special welcome. I know every week God's bringing new people here online. And uh, so, so just a brief recap. So what this series is about um, is that this is uh, a series, it's an in-depth study of one of the most important letters ever written in our, the second part of our Bibles, we call it the New Testament. It's a letter from one of the key leaders of the early movement of Jesus. His name is Paul, or we call him the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to a group of Christ followers who live in the capital city, the Roman Empire, in Rome itself. He's never met them, he's never been there, but he plans to visit them soon. And so we call this letter the letter to the Romans. Um, and in the opening sentence, he, 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 lists the, he gives the topic of this letter, what he calls the gospel of God. So this big picture story of our race and what's gone wrong and, and how God has worked through the coming of the Messiah to rescue and restore all of creation. And so uh, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been doing a deep dive into the opening chapter of this, the kind of the main body of this letter where Paul is, is, is starting the story of our race. And he says, what, what's happened with us as a race is that the, the God, though God has revealed himself clearly to us through creation and through human nature, through our conscience, that as a race, we've rejected that knowledge, that truth, because we don't really like what it reveals. We don't like what it requires. And so when we rejected the truth, the lights have gone on out on us as a race, and we've been plunged into darkness, not just intellectually, but spiritually, morally, ethically, uh, relationally. Uh, and as a result, that this leads to a downward spiral in every culture that starts with uh, spiritual confusion about who God is, and then leads to sexual confusion about who we are, and then finally ends up in social chaos. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a commentary on our culture right now. So we see this happening. And so uh, the last two weeks, we've been looking at the second stage of this downward death spiral, which is sexual confusion. So today we're going to wrap up this, this kind of second stage, kind of with one more, uh, kind of one more message about sexual confusion. And so uh, there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called The Gospel of God, Sexual Confusion, Part 3. And uh, we're going we're gonna to be just looking at one verse today. It's the verse we left off with last time. It's chapter 1 and verse uh, 27. And so if you, you've been here the last couple of weeks as, we, as we've dived into sexual confusion, that Paul says that one of the things that happens when, it, when a culture rejects the truth about who God is and who we are, we, we lose the truth about who we, who we are, especially in regards to our human sexuality. And so two weeks, we, we looked in the first stage of this confusion uh, sexual confusion is sexual immorality. Uh, the second stage we looked at last week, which is same-sex relationships. And what Paul said is that both of these, while they promise freedom, uh, that they actually lead to bondage. Uh, it actually leads to a loss of our humanity. He talks about the degrading of our bodies. He talked about last week about the due penalty that we pay uh, for this error or this deception. Uh, and so today, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in chapter 1, verse 27, just to set the stage for where we're going today. So in verse 27, remember verse 26, he began talking about same-sex relationships with women. And if you were here last week, remember he said that these were against nature. In other words, they're against the creator's design, which is why they're so destructive, uh, both to the individuals and to society as a whole. And so he says, today picks up, he, he says, this is the same with men. He said, in the same way, 
uh, way, the men also abandoned natural relations, right, those according to nature, with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. And men committed what? Shameful acts. As a culture, we have lost the concept of shame, haven't we? They're like nothing is shameful. Everything is okay. But, but, uh, but God says, no, th- this is shameful. This, these acts are shameful with other men. And then they received in themselves a due penalty for their error, for this, in the Greek, this delusion, this uh, deception. Now, this is where Paul wraps up this second stage of uh, sexual confusion, starts with sexual morality, uh, moves to same-sex relationships, and that's where he stops. But I honestly believe that if Paul were here today, that he would take it the next level and talk about the next level of confusion that we're experiencing in our culture, which is confusion over sex and gender. Now, the thing you ask the question, well, why didn't Paul address that? It's because this has never happened in the history of the world, by and large, until the last 50 years, until the sexual revolution in kind of Western culture, and especially it's picked up in the last five years in our culture, but I think you can clearly see kind of this, this pattern that Paul is laying out in Romans chapter 1. When you reject the truth about who God is, we, we lose the truth about who we are. We see that in our sexuality in terms of sexual immorality. In general, we see that in same sex. But in our culture, it's kind of a, t- it's a, it's a level of confusion that's unprecedented in the history of the human race. And so what I want to do today is I want to use this verse as a jumping off point to address this very important topic in our culture of sex and gender. Like, what does the Bible teach? How do we respond? And the the approach I want to take is just like last week uh, when we talked about same-sex relations. I want to uh, first start with a quick flyby. What does the Bible teach? What my goal today is to to compare and contrast sort of a biblical worldview of human sexuality and our cultural view of human sexuality, but especially in terms of sex and gender or what's often called transgender ideology. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna jump in. So there in your note sheet, um, we're gonna start with, hey, what's the Bible say? What's a Christian worldview on these topics? And then we're gonna come back and say, uh, so how? If we're followers of Jesus, how do we how do we live this out in a culture that's increasingly hostile? to a Christian worldview of human sexuality, especially in this area of transgender ideology, right? So let's jump in. So there in your note sheet, the gospel of God, uh, the Christian worldview. And so, um, uh, so the first, we're, we're, gonna go, we're gonna do a chronological uh, study through scripture just quickly in three chapters. Last week we had four. I actually wanted to do four today. I just don't have time. There's so much that had to cut out. But we're gonna do the first three. I think this will set us on solid ground. So the first step is creation. So one of the things we talked about last week, we saw last week, and we'll see this again this week, is that when Jesus, when the Apostle Paul, when the Apostles, when they would address issues of like human sexuality, they would always go back to the beginning of our story as a race, back to the creation account before we got messed up as a race. And like, if you want to see God's vision for sex, for marriage, for divorce, these sorts of things, uh, you have to go back to the, the, the start of the story before sin entered into the world. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to start with creation, and we're going to look at a passage we looked at last week, but we're going to look at it through, through different lenses because the topic today is not same-sex relations, it's, it's sex and gender. So if you were here last week, you know, the, the, when you open the very first page of the Bible, they were introduced immediately to this amazing creator who is incredibly powerful, uh, incredibly brilliant, uh, completely good, who out of his creativity uh, speaks into existence this amazing cosmos, which we're still exploring, right? Whether it's on the nano level or on the macro level, kind of the cosmic level, we're still scratching the surface of understanding that. And so uh, he speaks this creation into existence, and the high point of creation is the creation of the first man, the first woman. Remember we learned last week that, that we were created to be, first of all, like God, Remember, in his image, we are created to be in relationship with God, and we're created to rule over, his, over the creation for God. And so we're going to look at this verse we looked at last week. It's in uh, uh, Genesis 1, and 28. And so this is how this story, the, the high point of the creation account. It says, so God created mankind in his own what? Image. image. So, so catch this. We are image bearers as a race we are image, we, we're to reflect who God is, right? We're image bearers. Um, and in the image of God, he created them. And then what's he say next? 
Male and female, he created them. So I want you to catch from, from the biblical worldview of Jesus, the, the law of Moses, that, that as human beings, when God creates us, that we're created either male or female. And that this is part of our, our core identity. And as we'll see, uh, this maleness and females is an expressed, to be expressed in our sexuality. So there's a connection between what we call gender in our sexuality. And so he says that we're created um, male and female, and says God bless them, and he said, what's he say next? Be fruitful. In other words, have children, right? So what you see here in the creator is it's God's vision for human sexuality, for gender as he were created in his image. Part of that is each of us is created as male or female. That's to be expressed in our sexuality, in a marriage relationship, if God calls us to that. And this is the context in which children are to be uh, be brought up. And so what we see from, from the very beginning is a biblical view is that uh, sex and gender are two ways of talking about the same thing. That, that who we are, that God creates each of us as male or female, this is not something that we choose. It's something God chooses. It's part of our core identity as an image bearer. And then that gender is reflected in our physical bodies, in our sexuality. Uh, and this is all part of God's design uh, for, our, for his perfect world, all right? So... Um, so, of course, this is, what, this is the view that has been assumed, almost without exception, of all cultures of all time until the last 50 years. Right? Uh, and, so, and this is the view of science, and this is the view of biology until even science is now being, starting to be affected by trans ideology. But, but, you know, but in terms of science, uh, our, uh, pretty much every cell of our body is either an XX or an XY, right? Like, we're, we're like this is hardwired into who we are uh, as a race. And so from this point on, th this one, these two verses really, in, in a sense, summarize the Bible's teaching about sex and gender, that we are created, we're, we're embodied creatures, we're, we're created in the image of God, and part of that image is we're male or female, and, that, and that's revealed in our human sexuality. And, the, and those things all go together, right? Now, from this point on, the Bible is not going to address this issue a lot because, like I've said, this has never been an issue in human culture, right? And so, but, uh, but, but it is reflected every once in a while throughout the scriptures, this creation order is referred to. And so uh, the, the, uh, you see this, for example, in the law of Moses. That's our next stage. So in the law of Moses, remember when God calls uh, Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, he's, he calls them to be a holy nation. You should be holy as I am holy. And he says that you are to be a kingdom of priests. So we're not going to live like the nations around us. And he gives them many uh, ordinances that are regarding their sexuality, as we saw last week as well. When we get to Deuteronomy chapter 22, he's, he gives them a, a, a prohibition against um, what we would call today cross-dressing. And what we're going to see is, well, why is that important? Well, it's because we are created in the image of God, and that image is male or female that reflects his good creation. So to mix or confuse that is to go against nature and, and kind of corrupt his, uh, this, this perfect uh, creation that he's designed. And so look what he says. So he says, um, a woman must not wear uh, men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing for the Lord. And so, Lord in all caps, what's that mean? Yeah, Yahweh. So Yahweh, your God. Now, what's the next word? Detest. Anyone who does this. And so this is a serious thing. To confuse the created order is a serious thing. So if you were here last week, we did a deep dive on this word, detest. This is the same word we looked at last week that God uses to describe same-sex uh, acts. Um, and it's this Hebrew word, to'ava. And what we saw last week is that to'ava is a generic word. It can be used in a wide context, uh, set of contexts. And it refers to anything that is either, uh, depending on the context, morally or spiritually or socially kind of detestable, uh, something that's kind of despicable, something that's a, a deep offense, something that's very offensive, right? So we looked at that last week. We won't go into it today, but this is the same word that's used here. And so there's a very strong statement. Note that this created order of maleness and femaleness 
is to be expressed in our dress, the way we present ourselves. Now, quick comment, quick sidebar. Of course, this will change, right? This will change based on the culture that you're in. Uh, for example, there's a, a cool story that I can't tell you because I don't have time, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but for example, uh, it just, let's, let's put it this way. One time when I was young, I picked up a hitchhiker in the middle of no, like Utah. It was like 112 degrees. Oh, it's a long story why I pitched him, picked them up. Um, I thought it was part of this family that was stranded. It turns out he was just standing there by them to hitchhike. Uh, he was a young guy. I was like 23 at the time, 24. I pick up this guy. He's wearing OP shorts. That's all he has on. No shirt, no pants. And his first comment to me is, do you mind if I get into something a little bit more comfortable? <laughs> and I'm thinking like, what, a Speedo? You know, it's like I... And we're going through redneck country. This was a long time ago. Everyone got some truck and uh, gun racks. I've got California plates with a guy. He pulls out a Polynesian skirt and puts it on. And now we're going in together with this bare-chested Polynesian skirt guy uh, in redneck country, right? I saw my life flash before my eyes. Uh, but anyway, what the point is, hey, if you're in Polynesia, uh, guys will wear these skirts, right? Uh, if you're uh, Scotland, they might wear the kilts. And in that culture, that's masculine, right? Not in our culture. If I came up here with high heels and a skirt, you'd be concerned, right? <laughs> so, so the point is culture, what, what defines masculinity or femininity will, de- will vary for culture. But the idea is whatever culture you're in, you're not to present as the opposite sex. This is toa va, all right? Now, this is the word, so, um, so this is, of course, the word of God that, that Jesus grew up with. This was the standard of Israel when he was there. And as I said last week, he doesn't, he doesn't address this specifically because this is not, uh, this is not uh, you know, an issue in Israel or anywhere in the ancient world, really, at that time. Um, but, uh, but Jesus does do some teaching on marriage and divorce. It actually touches on this issue of gender and sex. And so let me just set this up. So... Uh, one, on, on one occasion, the lead, some of the, the religious leaders come to Jesus and they ask him to weigh in on this big, uh, big debate of their day between rabbis of, is it okay to, for a man to divorce his wife? And if so, under what conditions? And so uh, Jesus is gonna weigh in on that. Um, and we don't have time to, to do a deep dive in this, in this whole uh, conversation. But, but what I want you to catch is what he does, he said, if you wanna understand how God feels about marriage and divorce you have to go back to creation. You have to go back before the fall. And I want you to see what he says to them. This is from Matthew 19. He says, haven't you read, which is really sort of a slight because these guys are experts in the Bible, right? So it's like, you guys kind of miss this, that that at the beginning, so he goes back to the beginning, the creator, and then he quotes from Genesis 1. He he said, he he creator made them what? And so, so Jesus says, hey, this is the creation reality that we're dealing with in marriage. And then he goes, that's from Genesis 1. And he says, and then he quotes from Genesis 2. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Notice a man with a wife. And the two will become one flesh. So he says, if you want to understand God's vision for marriage, you have to understand that we're created male and female. And that's designed to come together in marriage as a man and a wife. And so, of course, this speaks to uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, We just didn't have time to talk about that last week, but obviously it speaks to that. But what I want to judge for our purpose today, it speaks to this, to Jesus' perspective, that if you want to understand human beings, we're created male and female. That's part of our core identity of who we are. All right, so, so that's just a quick flyby. If we had time, we would look at one passage from the Apostle Paul, but it's kind of a complicated passage and it takes too long to explain it. So I'm not gonna go, go into that, but I'll, I'll give you some more resources later on. But, but this, is, this is basically the biblical view, all right, that, that, that we were created, each of us, as male or female. And that there is no distinction between uh, sex and gender that our maleness or femaleness is reflected in our bodies 
and our kind of the way we're designed sexually to come together. And so gender and sex come together. So another way of putting that is that like we can change our clothes, we can change the look of our bodies, um, but before our creator, he, we will always be male and female. That he will never use our chosen pronouns. Right? He will choose his chosen pronouns. All right? Okay, so now, having said that, the question is, as followers of Jesus, how do we live this out uh, in, in a culture that's increasingly hostile to kind of a Christian worldview uh, that's really bought into kind of a transgender ideology, an enti- entirely different worldview we'll talk about a little bit later, um, and, and it's increasingly hostile. And what I'm going to suggest is that as followers of Jesus, we need to embrace these three C's like we talked about last week. I'll give them to you later, but just at the beginning, I just want to say that we need to, to live this out with the three C's, with clarity, with compassion, and with courage, okay? The three C's. And so let's jump in. So there in your note sheet, you have a section called the gospel of God, Who, how should we respond? Now, you'll notice there, so the first C is the C of clarity. And you'll notice there I put several different books, some of these by believers, some by non-believers. And the reason is, uh, this is such a big topic, all we can do today is skim the surface of it. But I I put these resources there for you if you want to explore this more in any particular area as we go through that says, hey, this is where the rub is, or this is what I need to understand in the situation I'm facing. All right, so I'll refer to those books as we go through. So, So what I'm saying is that that as followers of Jesus, the first thing that we need to live out our, our faith well is we need clarity. And we need it on two different fronts. Well, there's two different kinds of clarity. First of all, we need to get clear on what the Bible, what Jesus, kind of a Christian worldview. We need to be really clear on kind of God's vision for a race. And so that's what we just did, just kind of a cursory flyby of it. And you say, if you would like to learn more about this, like, hey, I've read things on the internet, or there's certain arguments, or certain Christians would say, well, we should, we should support transitioning, or, or whatever, things like that, um, that if you want to kind of study that more, the book I would recommend is the first book there on your note sheet that's called Embodied by Preston uh, Sprinkle. And Preston, is, uh, he's a, a believer. He has his PhD in, uh, in, in, in uh, biblical theology, biblical studies. And so this is kind of the focus of his whole ministry, uh, Christian sexuality issues. And so he does a great job talking theologically, biblically about the Christian worldview. He talks about a lot of other things too, but that would probably be the place if, if, that's, if you say, I want to get more clarity on this Christian worldview uh, aspect. But when I talk about clarity, it's not just kind of clarity in terms of, hey, what's a Christian worldview, that we need to get a a clarity on the topic of transgenderism itself. Like, Like, we need to understand the history of the movement. Like, we need to understand uh, the worldview that it flows out of. We need to understand what science says. We need to understand what research says. Right? We, we need to understand uh, what trans activists, uh, their ultimate goal is. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And so, on, so, so uh, there on, on your uh, note sheet, there's some other resources, and I'll walk you through which one's for what in just a minute. But let me give you an example. Let me, let me walk through what I would say. Here, here's sort of the, the kind of the mainstream narrative about transgenderism in our culture. And you hear it at every level. You hear it at healthcare. Uh, you hear it in our educational system. You hear it in our schools. Uh, by the way, I think it's this week. I might be next, but I think I saw that this week that LA Unified is having a coming out week, yes. right, where there's a curriculum for, for elementary school teachers for every day of the week. Um, I've heard some, some believers are saying we're going to pull our kids out. Uh, that's an individual decision. But I know for me, like if I had a child, there's no way. I would put them this, I would say no way when we're not going this week to school. But, um, but anyway, so, um, so here, here, whether it's school, whether it's government, whether it's media, uh, this is a constant narrative of our culture. And it goes like this, that, 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 um, that when, when our, first of all, that our culture is saying that sex and gender are not the same thing, that you can be a one sex and a different gender. So you, you can be a woman in a man's body, 
Or you can be a, a man in a woman's body. You might have a woman's brain and a man's body or vice versa. And so that, that sex and gender are being separated out. Secondly, that when there's a conflict between your inner sense of yourself, kind of who you, who you feel like you are, and what your body says about you, you always need to go with your inner sense of self. Right? That that needs to be. So in other words, if there's, a, if there's a conflict between your body and your personal sense of self, you, you need to not change your mind to match the body. You need to change the body to match the mind. And so what needs to happen is you need to start transitioning. Now, I know for some of you, you're knee-deep in this, and this is very like, oh, yeah, I know that. That's why, before, you know, remember, a lot of us, this is brand new, and so let me just, the basics of this. So you need to transition so that your body and your mind align. And so the first step is what we call social transitioning, which is where you change your name, you change your pronouns, you change the way you dress, maybe the way you talk, maybe the way you walk, but you, you begin presenting uh, as the opposite sex. Uh, and, then, um, and then the next step, and the, especially if you're a young child, when, when this happens, is we're going we're gonna to start administering puberty blockers, right, to stop puberty. And, and the, the reason for that, at least the claimed reason, is that we want to give you more time to figure out who you truly are, because only you know as an eight-year-old or whatever, seven-year-old, you, only you know what you truly are. So we're going we're gonna to slow down puberty, um, which, by the way, some of that, there's a lot of evidence that this, there's changes that can never be retrieved from this, by the way. Uh, and then followed by that, assuming that this is going well and you want to continue, the next step is to start taking sex hormones, so either estrogen or testosterone, to masculinize or feminize your body. And then the next step, if you so choose it, uh, even at a young age, 13 or whatever, even at a young age, you can decide to have sex reassignment uh, of uh, surgery of, of various sorts, to various extremes, to, to make your, your, your inner sense of self align, right? So, so the, the narrative is, if this is happening, even at a young age, this is what you need to do. This is what you have to do. And uh, the part of the narrative is that all these changes are actually reversible, and these are all safe. Okay? These are all safe, um, even though our, there are no long-term studies on these things. Um, and, um, and that the next step is that this is actually the solution to all your problems, your anxiety, your depression, uh, your sense of not belonging, and that this is actually your path to freedom. And if you don't do this, or if you have a child that's going through this, and you don't uh, affirm this and help them transition, then good chances they're going to die. So that's the narrative. Right. So that's the narrative you're going to get at LA Unified. That's the LA, you're going to get at school system. You're going to see it on social media. You're going to see it in our government. That's, it's a very consistent media, right? And so what I want to suggest to you is that most, if not all, of this is not based in science, biology, or research. And I, I just want to give you an example of that. Let's say that you have a young child... Um, and, and so there, there is a very real condition that's always been considered a medical illness or kind of a medical condition, a mental, a mental illness that's called gender dysphoria. Okay? So gender dysphoria is, is when a person experiences a conflict, a psychological conflict inside of them between who they feel they are, they, they are as a male or female and their bodies. So it usually starts very young, and historically, uh, this has usually been in young boys, not girls, hardly at all. Um, and, um, and so usually, and so, so when you have gender dysphoria, it can be very mild or it can be very intense. It varies. And so, um, like if you're a young boy, then it's like, uh, you, you know, you, you know, and you, like you're young, you, you want to do kind of girlish types of things, right, so to speak. Uh, this is the way the theory goes. Uh, if, if you're, you know, and so, so what I want you to catch is gender dysphoria is very real. And it can be extremely painful. And we'll talk more about that. But here's what you will never hear in the news, but every research has shown. That if you have a child, this is usually shows up very young. If you have a child with gender dysphoria and you do not social transition them, you just, you just continue to, 
kind of let, the, let this play out, that every study has shown, depending on the study, that between 70 to 90% will grow out of this. These are all secular studies, 70 to 90%, and usually it's through by, by going through puberty. Now, not everyone will, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, so, so 30, you know, anywhere from 10 to uh, 30% won't grow out of this, right? So depending on the study, it could be 70% will grow out or other studies, 90%. And this is well documented. And this is an example of something you will never hear. What you'll be constantly told is that if you have a child like this, you have to do this. Because if you don't, chances are your child is going to commit suicide. And what they won't tell you is the statistics for those who have transitioned completely that the level of suicide in, in, trans, in the trans people is multiples of normal. So they won't, they won't tell you that either. This is the narrative. All I want you to understand, we don't have time to go through the whole thing and every step and every, but what I want you to catch is that there's a narrative out there and it's not really aligned with either science or biology or research. It's being driven by ideology. And it's been driven by a worldview. And so we just need to do a little bit of worldview background, a little bit of worldview, remember, okay? So, so what is the worldview? Well, you remember that with the Enlightenment, we entered into a new worldview that was called uh, naturalism or scientific materialism or materialism. They're just different names. But the basic idea is that there is no God. There is no spiritual reality. There's only physical reality. And, um, and, so, um, and, and, and through science, we can discover what is really true. So only things that are proved by science. Which, that's, that's kind of naturalism. But after a while, people began to realize that doesn't really make any sense. Because if we're just the result of billions of years of random accidents, how can I trust that this brain that's an accident is actually giving me an accurate view on reality? And, and how can we even believe in free will? We're just programmed by nature to do this. And so, so what arose is the movement, the next worldview was called postmodernism. Remember? And in postmodernism, there is no truth. Uh, there is no right and wrong. There's only your perception of truth, my per your truth and my truth. So out of that, when, when postmodernism begins to get applied to real life, one of the ways it's, it's, it's applied is what's called critical theory. Now, you've probably heard of critical race theory, but catch this, critical theory is a larger umbrella that takes in pretty much every field of study in academia. So Critical race is just talking about race, but they all share the basic, the basic concepts. And the basic concepts is there is no truth. And so anyone who tells you that something is true is just using their narrative to oppress you. So those in power, those in power, the dominant, uh, the dominant group in power, uh, they're going to create a narrative that supports their power and oppresses others. And so in, in critical race theory, it revolves around kind of whites oppressing others, right? But when this theory is applied to sexuality, it leads to what we call queer theory. And queer theory is what is driving the transgender movement. Now, let me be super clear here. There are many, many, perhaps even most people who identify as trans that would not embrace all queer theory. But trans activists, trans activists, all embrace, or almost all, embrace queer theory. And, and catch this, it's activism that's driving our culture in education. In, and so you say, well, what's queer theory? Queer theory says, hey, those in power were the people, were Christians. And Christians had this narrative that the only sex is in marriage, heterosexual, and so they've oppressed everyone else. So the solution is we need to tear down and destroy every normative sexual ethic in society to lead to freedom. 
And the trans movement is the ultimate statement of that. There is no gender. And for activists, there is, isn't, if, it isn't even what we call biological sex, that all of that is what we call a, uh, just a kind of a, a, a social construct. Uh, something, it's a story that's been made up to oppress others. And so this is, this is, the, this is the queer theory is what drives trans activism. And so the goal will never, it will never stop until there is never anything that's right in realm, in the, in, in the realm of sexuality. And you know what the next frontier is? The next frontier is sex with children. And this has already started. If you watch the news, you will never hear anyone arrested or accused of pedophilia. The new language that's being introduced is these are minor attracted persons, which takes the stigma away and says, why should they not have their rights? You see, heterosexual sexuality is oppressing these people. Why should children not have sexual rights? They, they, if they can decide their gender, they can decide whether they want to have sex or not. They're, they're old enough to do that. And these people that happen to be attracted to them why are we oppressing them and not allowing them to live out? See what I'm saying? So this is all part of a worldview that flows out of postmodernism, applied critical theory, and then applied to sexuality becomes, so, uh, becomes queer theory. So, so the question is, so who, are, who is the greatest threat to, to, those who, to, trans, to, to activists? Christians. Christians are the enemy. They're the greatest impediment to breaking down in society all sexual norms. So what I want you to catch is that if we're going to, if as followers of Jesus, we're going to listen and follow him well and represent him well, we have to get clear not only on what the Christian worldview is, we need to understand the worldview that's, that's driving this. And so I put some books there on your um, note sheet, and I want to walk you through them. The, the second book on your note sheet uh, when Sally Becomes Harry is one of the best books I've ever written, uh, read on this. Uh, I actually listened to this about seven years ago before this was a thing, but I just kind of knew it was coming. And, um, and this book is, I, I believe Ryan Anderson is a believer, but the book is not a Christian book. There's no biblical verses. There's no biblical argument. He's just arguing from, from nature, from uh, uh, human history, you know, things like that. Court cases, kind of helping you understand the movement. It's an excellent book on this. In fact, it's so good that Amazon has banned it. So a couple years ago, they banned this. Though this book is like, it's just, here's the research from Johns Hopkins University. Here's the research from Columbia. Here's the research. It's like, it's top level, but, but it's, it's against the narrative, right? And so I'm like, that's crazy. It's like, well, at least I have it on my Audible. So I go to Audible. They've taken it away. They took my book, yeah. You can still get it, but you can't get it through Amazon. Uh, second, the second two books are both written by non-believers. So one of the beautiful things that's happening in our culture is there are secular authors who don't agree with all of our worldview, but they can see the damage of this and the, uh, the, the, the craziness of this. And so the, the, uh, I wouldn't recommend all their worldview, but they're extremely helpful. And so the, the first book, especially for those of you who have children, uh, and especially girls, it's called uh, Irreversible Damage. It's the transgender craze seducing our daughters by Abigail Schreier. Uh, excellent book, introducing, but to help us understand the incredible pressure that on our children today. Can I tell you something? If you're a 12-year-old girl and you're an outcast in your class, the fastest way to go from being an outcast to a cool kid is to become trans. This is a very powerful movement among our students. And if you have younger kids, even if you have, if you have younger kids, even they're like preschool right now, you need to be reading this, right? You need to be learning about kind of this and, and be an understanding of Christian worldview and so on, and then what's happening in our culture. And then the, the book that's the next book that's uh, probably the most technical of all, but uh, really excellent on the whole history of the movement and so on, is called Trans When Ideology Meets Reality. So here's the thing, and I want you to catch, is that 
this movement is being driven by ideology. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, ideology is pretty impervious to facts. So let me give you an example. Well, there's a movement in our culture towards socialism, right? And so I, I realize there's different kinds of socialism, but when you talk to someone, like, I know this is the thing, we need to redistribute wealth. It's kind of Marxist in its background. You know, the problems of culture, there's the oppressors, the, uh, the, the, those who are the owners of production versus this thing. We need to, so we need to equalize everything. And if you say to them, well, you know, that was kind of tried in Russia, Soviet Union, that was tried in Eastern Europe, that was tried in Cambodia, that was tried in, uh, in China, and as a, result, as a result, 200 million people were killed. And what they'll say, if they're really committed, is, yeah, but they just did it the wrong way. What I want you to catch is when ideology meets reality, that ideology can be impervious to facts. Right, and, so, and so we need to understand like, what's happening in our culture with clarity. Okay, number two, the second C is the C of compassion. And this is so important. You know, as followers of Jesus, um, we are called to love God and love people, right? And that includes our enemies. Like, we don't get a pass on that. And this is where often as Christians, we've gone off the rails. We see something that's evil or destructive, and we go on the attack. Uh, not against the ideology, but attack against the people. And we become haters. And when we become haters, we fall into Satan's trap. Yeah. Right? So, so we are called to love, even those who would be, hey, these activists that are, that are, are, are recommending, they're driving these things, that our, our kids, are, their bodies are being mutilated as age of 12 or 13. Right? I, I saw a, I was listening to a detransitioner uh, talk to a school board in, in a recent YouTube thing, and here's this beautiful young woman who's probably in her young 20s, but she's sharing with the school board, you're, you're pushing this, medical, you're pushing this. She said, I had double mastectomy. I had my uterus removed, but this didn't bring the peace I was seeking. And so I've detransitioned back, but now my whole life has been ruined. Right? And when you see this level of evil that's being happened for, what, for good motives or bad, but on our children and our, it's like it, there's an anger that rises up, and that's appropriate anger, but we need to live that out in love, right? And so we need to have compassion. But, but when I talk about compassion here, I'm not just talking about like, compassion to those who hold a different view. I'm talking about those who, compassion for those who are struggling with this, whether they're in our midst, in our life groups, in our church, our kids, or whether in culture. And so th this may be, you, you may be talking with, with someone who's one of the, 10 to 20 to 30 percent of gender dysphoria who, who's actually really struggling with this, and this can be extremely painful. If you have a strong case of gender uh, dysphoria that persists, uh, it can be excruciatingly painful psychologically. And um, in, um, in, in Preston Sprinkle's book, Embody, he talks about this, and so that's another benefit of that book. Um, so you may be talking to someone like that. You may be talking to a tween or to a adolescent girl who has suddenly come home and announced to you that she is trans or she's on our youth group and she's trans and she's part of this, what we call this uh, social contagion that teenage girls have always been, this has been uh, common among uh, teenage girls, where something becomes a faddish thing to, to be the solution to the angst we all go through in adolescence and in, during puberty. And, uh, and so, so there's this Traditionally, there's been hardly any gender dysphoria in girls, but now it's just the number is like rocketing, and it's coming what they call late onset gender dysphoria, happening in you know like adolesc early adolescence, and it seems to be a social contagion. But for that gr for that girl, that that may be the person you're talking to. You may be talking to an adult who transitioned and has lived as the opposite sex for many years. But here's what I want you to catch. It doesn't matter which kind of person we're talking to, that almost everyone who's decided to become trans decided so because of a deep pain in their life. It's because of anxiety, it's because of depression, it's because of feeling rejected, and, and this is being sold in our cult. This is the way out. This is the solution to your problem. And so as followers of Jesus, whenever we're dealing with someone, we need to slow it down, not have simplistic answers. We need to listen to their story. One of the things that Preston Sprinkle says over and over again in his book, which is so good, he said, if you know one trans 
you know one trance. That every story is different. So don't assume. Don't come up with simple answers. Take the time to listen. I'm going to love them well. But when we talk about compassion, of course, true compassion doesn't mean embracing a lie. It doesn't mean affirming something that is not true. It doesn't mean agreeing to go along with your new identity. It doesn't mean encouraging someone in their transition. It doesn't mean even using their pronouns. That as followers of Jesus who believe in a creator who's created as male or female, their true path to freedom is going to be to embrace their true identity and to help align their perception of reality with reality. Let me give you an example. Another kind of mental illness that we're more familiar with is anorexia, anorexia nervosa. And if you know that, uh, often in young girls, for example, but it could be anyone, but uh, the, the young girl, as she looks in the mirror, she looks to herself as if she's fat. She looks overweight. You looking on her, she, she's emaciated. In fact, she's in danger of dying. If she doesn't start eating, she will die. So her perception of reality and reality are, are wrong, you see? So, so how, do we, how do we help her? We don't come and affirm her. Okay, well, you, you see yourself as fat? Okay, you're fat. Like, we, that's not helpful. Like, what we do is we love, we listen, we support, and our goal is to help her realign her perception of reality with reality so she can thrive. So the reality is a man can't become a woman. A woman can't become a man. That's, that's reality. And that path will not lead to freedom. It will not lead to fulfillment. And it doesn't, which is why the suicide rate is so high. You know, it's interesting how God orchestrates messages. You know, this week I was working on this message, and I normally finish my message on Wednesday, kind of turn it in, the note sheet and all that, it normally takes me about three hours on Wednesday to finish a message, the last stage of a message. This week, it took seven hours. And, uh, and so about one o'clock in the afternoon, I, I said, I need to go, go for a walk up the cross. When my brain just gets fried, I'd go for a walk up the cross, gets the endorphins coming, come out with fresh eyes. So as I was coming down from this, this walk, um, there's a man driving from our offices out you know, to, to leave our property. He's in a blue, little blue, blue truck. And I can tell he's really excited to see me. And, um, and so I go up to him, and I realize I've met him before, just briefly, a couple months ago at the back of our worship center here. And he said, hey, I just dropped off uh, my testimony, my story. And uh, he had shared with me a little bit when I met him in person, but I'd forgotten, kind of, I'd forgotten the face and the name. And so he said, I just wanted to share. He said, I know it's, the, the message is probably all done. And, uh, and everything, but I just want to share my story with you again, and I put it in writing, and uh, I said, actually, I'm in the middle of it, so who knows, this might make it into the message, right? So his story is that, that he came to Christ, um, and he came to Christ out of a, a background of deep drug and alcohol use, and he said the Lord supernaturally delivered him. But after that, even though he'd given his life to Jesus, he, he fell into this transgender uh, teaching, and felt like this might be the way for him. And so he, he went the whole way, not the whole way, but he, he began to take the sexual hormones to, to, to make himself more feminine. Um, and, and then he actually had surgery uh, just above the waist, which is important for later on. But he had surgery, and so he lived his life as a woman for 11 years. But he said it didn't bring him peace and it didn't bring in joy. And the longer time went on, it was just getting more and more depressed. And so God brought him here to Rocky Peak a few years ago. And he says, I sat here and listened to the messages. God began to move in my heart. And God began to give me a new vision for my life. And he said, two years ago, I went back to the same surgeon that did my first surgery and said, I want that reversed. And he said, the Lord has just met me and he's forgiven me and he's transformed me. And he said, I just live to praise him because of the life that I'm so full of, right? 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 And, then, and that's our message, right? Our, our message is not that, hey, this is just wrong. Our message is there's a better way. 
Like, this is not who you are. Like, when you stand before Jesus at the end of time, he's not going to call you by your preferred pronouns, right? That he's going to say, no, no, you've been, this is who you are. And so when we come to Jesus, we enter into this, that we all enter this new transformation process. And we all come out of different things and wrong thinking. But for someone who's coming out of this background, it's a, it's a, it's a reaffirmation, the Holy Spirit, no, you are who I created you to be, and this is the path to life. And, and brothers and sisters, I want this to be a church that lives with that compassion and truth, right? And so I want you to catch this. This man came, I'm assuming, dressed as a woman for many years, the Rocky Peak. And, and you may be here in that same boat today or vice versa. And, and so we need to, when, when someone presents in that way, we need to not go into this mode of just judgment and condemnation. We, we need to say, you're welcome here. Let's hear your story. And together, let's see how all of us can be transformed into the image of God together. Amen? Amen. Okay. The last C is the C of courage. And, you know, we live in this culture that's increasingly, for reasons I explained, anti-Christian. And for transgender activists, many of them hate Christians. It's like this is, this is the one obstacle, right? And so as followers of Jesus, um, we need to stand always with Jesus for what is good, what is right, and what is true. Uh, and this requires courage. Um, many times you'll hear me say this, uh, if you pay attention, you, you may not have kind of notice this pattern, but often when I'm teaching, I'll talk about these big three, uh, that God's working for what is good and right and true. And that comes out of one of my favorite passages of Scripture in Ephesians 5. It's there on your note sheet. It says, Paul writing to these these people who've come to Jesus, he said, before you came to Jesus, you were once darkness, but now you are what? You're light. And remember how Jesus called this to be the city on the hill, like the light, we're the light of the world. He said, so live as children of light, For the fruit of the light consists in, catch this, in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And so as followers of Jesus, we're we're called to live our lives out out loud for what is good, what is right, what is true. And he says, find out what pleases the Lord. And the catch this, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather what? Expose him. So remember what Jesus said. He said, you are the light of the world. Catch this. He didn't say you are a light. No, you are the light. And if the light of the world goes out, the world is completely in darkness. This is our calling. But in order to be light, we have to have the courage to stand for what is good, what is right, and what is true. We, we can't compromise in order to fit the culture, to make people happy, Um, that if we truly love God and people, we can't embrace a lie. You know, as I was preparing this, the first week I started working on this message many months ago, um, a a story came to mind. It was a story that we started the day with about these two strangers who come into the capital city with these big claims about this magic cloth and its, its supernatural abilities. And you know, it comes to the king and he commissions it. I don't know if you recognize that story. It's a very famous fairy tale. It was by Hans Christian Andersen called The Emperor's New Clothes. And, and so um, I, I, like probably like most of you, I'd heard this for my whole life, but I'd never actually read the fairy tale. And so I did. And so let me, let me, if you're not familiar, let me tell you the story. So what happens is that he commissions these men to start weaving and the, the, the looms are set up in the special room in the castle. People can come in and watch them. And to all appearances, these guys are going to town on the loom, like they're doing the weaving, um, but, but no one can see the cloth. But no one wants to admit it because that would mean that you are stupid or incompetent. So the weavers are saying, hey, you see this cloth? This is the most beautiful cloth in the world. And everyone's going, yes, it's so beautiful. It's remarkable. And finally, the day comes when it's time to fit the king with these special clothes and the emperor, and they, they, bring, they, they bring in this cloth and all the court is there watching and, and they're putting it up and they're going through the motions, you know, taking the measurements and all this and, and no one can see the cloth, but no one wants to say it because that would mean that they're stupid. They're not wise. They can't see this beautiful cloth. 
And so finally, as the story goes forward, there comes a day when there's going to be a parade through the capital. The emperor's going to be wearing his new clothes. People from far and wide have come. He's been carried on a canopy through the streets. And everyone's cheering and praising the beauty of this cloth because no one wants to be seen as stupid, unwise, incompetent. Of course, the reality is the king is in his underwear. And as they come around the corner, there's a little boy there who's too young to know better. And he cries out above the crowd, the emperor has no clothes. (laughs) And the moment he does, it breaks the spell because what this little boy said, everyone knew all along. And the king had to be rushed away in embarrassment. And then I want to tell you, this transgender ideology, it has no clothes. It's, it's anti-science, it's anti-biology, it's anti-research. And yet it's being sold and distributed by every facet of our culture. And for us to stand up against it and to say, I don't buy that, I don't agree with that, it's going to require a great deal of courage. But this is what it requires for us to follow Jesus well. You know, the, when I was working on this series, I came across a quote that was ascribed to C.S. Lewis. And usually when I, I see something like this, I'll chase it down to make sure, hey, what book was it? Make sure it's all legit. And as I did this, it became apparent. I'm not sure this is a legit quote. It's kind of, people disagree. Couldn't really find where you'd said it. Um, but I laughed because I thought, well, uh, if it's not from C.S. Lewis, it sure sounds like something he would say. <laughs> and whether he said it or not, I love the quote. Amen. And it goes like this. When the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And that's what we're called to. Uh, One of my great heroes, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian writer who refused to bow down to the communist regime in the Soviet Union, as a result was sent for many, many years to the Soviet gulag, this horrible prison system. But when he was finally released, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's a believer, a believer in Jesus. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize, and and he was asked, what can you do when you live in a communist land where you have no freedoms, no freedom of speech, and, and you have no way, you have no way to push back? And this is what he said. He said, well, you can resolve to live your life with integrity. Let your credo be this. Let the lie come into the world. Let it even triumph, but not through me. Amen. 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 And so as followers of Jesus, this is our calling, to share a different story. Hey, no, no. You are a man or a woman created in the image of God. There is a creator who loves you, right? And he has sent his son not only to forgive us, but to transform us by the power of his spirit. And that your true path to freedom and fulfillment is not to deny who you are, to to embrace the truth, to invite the creator into your life and let him lead you to the freedom of a new life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. So, Father, we come today and just such important things we're talking about, but just such heavy things as well. And, Lord, I just pray that you would just uh, give us the grace and wisdom that as a church that we would, we would grow, we would grow in our understanding and our clarity in these important issues, that you would truly give us your heart of compassion, whether it's for activists who are, are actually uh, kind of targeting us, or whether it's for trans people who are just trying to figure out their life, and they're just trying to find a place of peace. They're just searching for identity in a world that's completely lost its mind. But either way, give us great compassion that we could take the message of the creator, the message of Jesus, who's come to do the recreation in our life. And give us the courage, Lord, that we would be men and women. I know that we all are in different situations, and that courage will require, will will cost us in different ways. But give us the courage, Lord, that, that the lie may come, and the lie may even win. We don't know, but, but it won't come through us. That we will stand for what is good and what is right and true not just because it's right, but because it is truly the path to life and because we love people too much to embrace a lie. 
that's actually leading to their destruction. And so, Lord, we pray that as the song sings, that like for the sake of the world, that we would be true to you, be the light of the world, and live out this life of integrity, truth, and love. In Jesus' name, amen.